This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. Hello and welcome to episode 87 of the 1001 Movies Podcast. Based on the book, 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die. This week I'll be talking about Vittoria De Sica's 1948 Italian classic, Bicycle Thieves. Born in 1901 in the town of Sora in Italy, Vittorio De Sica's career as a filmmaker began just like so many others on the stage. Through the 1920s and 30s, he became a matinee idol in Italy's pre-war studio system, working mostly in romantic comedies. He directed his first film in 1940 and made a handful of films throughout World War II. By 1945, however, Italy's studio system was a thing of the past. Those few that existed either went bankrupt or were bombed during the war. De Sica wanted to keep making movies, he just didn't have the resources usually afforded to him. His 1946 film Shoeshine was made on and around the streets of Rome using all location work and many non-actors. The film was such a success worldwide that it earned an Oscar nomination for Best Writing of Original Screenplay and also a Special Academy Award presented by Gene Herschel to De Sica and his crew announcing the high quality of this motion picture brought to eloquent life in a country scarred by war is proof that the creative spirit can triumph over adversity. De Sica once told the story that while making Shoeshine, he was riding his bicycle in the streets of Rome when he came across Roberto Rossellini sitting at a cafe outside. When he asked what Rossellini was working on, he explained that he was making a film in which a comedian would star as a solemn priest. The film in question was Rome Open City. And De Sica added that he was making a picture on the streets of the city. De Sica later claimed that this was the moment that Italian neorealism was born into the world of cinema, and I guess this is quite possibly true. Shoeshine and Rome Open City would indeed be the first two films that ushered in the prosperous era of Italian neorealism as we now know it. Shoeshine was, of course, just the beginning for De Sica. His friend and collaborator Cesar Zavattini presented him with the book Bicycle Thieves by Luigi Bartolini, and they soon started a script for a film that was very, very loosely based on the book. At the time, screenwriting was a wholly collaborative effort in Italian filmmaking, with as many as nine people working together to come up with the finished product. The titles of Bicycle Thieves credit seven people for the script, but this was because De Sica was friends with so many people in Rome's artistic community that he would promise to put their names in the credits in return for favors. The script was actually written by De Sica, Zavattini, and Suso Di Amico, the last of which would later claim responsibility for the film's ending moments. Now, finding funding for the film was quite a task, even after De Sica's success with Shoeshine. Indeed, David Old Selznick was willing to produce the film, but he wanted Cary Grant to play the lead. De Sica declined this offer, of course, realizing that it would be impossible for Americans to properly translate his idea of Italian neorealism in a commercial context. After failing to drum up enough money from a tentative French producer, De Sica and his colleagues returned to their hotel in Milan, and in the lobby, they were introduced to a French count who, within an hour of meeting De Sica and learning about the movie, agreed to pay a substantial portion of the funding. The rest was paid by two friends of the director, both of which managed the accounting and the production office. Part of the genius of Bicycle Thieves is its simplicity of story, which can be summed up with only a couple sentences. Impoverished family man Antonio, played by Lamberto Maggiorani, is hired to put up posters throughout town, and his wife pawns off their bed sheets to buy back Antonio's bicycle, which is required for the job. On his first day on the job, however, the bicycle is stolen, and the remainder of the film is Antonio and his little boy Bruno, played by Enzo Steola, going from place to place throughout the city to track the bicycle down and keep Antonio from losing his job and the family going hungry. Now, before I continue, I want to address the title. 
The Italian title is Ladre di Bicicolette, and the word ladre is plural for thief, making the literal translation bicycle thieves. The promotional material in the United States, however, called it the bicycle thief. And this is what American audiences called it for years, maybe up until the Criterion Collection released it on DVD in the 2000s. While Rossellini's world of Italian neorealism involved casting well-known actors who were usually typecast in completely different roles, De Sica may have put the real in neorealism by casting non-actors. Assistant director Luigi Alessandri claimed to have spent months in the streets of Rome and scouring construction sites for someone with the right look to play the lead role, Antonio. She eventually found factory worker Lamberto Maggiorani. Nine-year-old Enzo Steola was walking home from school when he noticed a car following him, and he quickly ran home. Days later, he learned that there was a casting call for young actors to play Bruno just around the corner from his house. De Sico had seen Enzo on the street from his car and intentionally held the casting call nearby so the boy would come in. Journalist uh, Leonella Carell went to interview De Sica and was hired on the spot to play Maria, Antonio's beleaguered wife. Many of the people seen in the background were not hired extras, but actual people they photographed on the spot. In a scene in which Antonio and Bruno visit a church, the scene is filled with actual homeless men, anxiously waiting for filming to wrap up so they could be fed by the clergy. The actual process of filming was almost as informal, although craftily methodical, as the casting. The Sika's crew didn't get a permit to secure the streets, and they were going to be interrupted continually by traffic. He allegedly asked his crew member to dress up as a policeman and direct traffic away from the filming location. Stories abounded that he slapped young Enzo Steola and put lit cigarettes into his pockets to get him to act distressed, but Steola later refuted this. DeSico had already sharpened his skills of directing children with shoeshine, and he was unusually direct with all of his actors, often acting out the scene for them and telling them to do it the way he did it. This may seem unprofessional, but it worked. Bicycle Thieves premiered on December 22, 1948, in Naples. The initial reception was not favorable. Families allegedly approached Asika after the film and told him they wanted their money back. The critics were not extremely friendly either, although obviously within time, their opinions swayed the other way. The film had a wonderful reception in America, getting Zavattini a nomination for Best Writing for Original Screenplay and winning the Special Foreign Language Film Award, a category that was not yet competitive and involved voting by the Academy's Board of Governors to determine the single recipient. Nowadays, Bicycle Thieves is a staple in film classes around the world, and it's often coupled with Citizen Kane as marking the beginning of modern cinema. One thing was certain, Bicycle Thieves is certainly the landmark beginning of Italian neorealism, a movement created by necessity that eventually flowered into popularity by the 1960s. De Sica would go on to make films like Umberto D and The Garden of the Finci Contini's, which I discussed back in episode 27. But what did I think of Bicycle Thieves? I've always kind of thought it was mundane to praise a film simply because it's popular in the zeitgeist or, or history of film, but this one is pretty damn good. Putting its historical importance aside, it remains an amazingly touching story. The irony here is that it's just about a guy and his son looking for a stolen bicycle, but within the film's tight 89 minutes, they go through so many emotional up and downs, it's almost exhausting. Antonio's emotional state throughout the movie is almost parallel to the stages of death. First, he's angry, then he's desperate, he's hopeful, then he seems accepting of his fate and treats himself and Bruno to an expensive meal, he's resentful, and then, in the final moments of the film, he turns to desperation and steals a bicycle himself. This scene, which as I mentioned was added as an afterthought, is surprisingly heartbreaking. This is a hard-working man who, through no fault of his own, has been deprived of the ability to feed his family, it practically sifts through his city to find his bicycle, and then makes a single attempt that's desperate and beneath him and almost puts him in jail. This scene is made even more touching by his son Bruno's reaction, who breaks into tears when he realizes that his father is willing to stoop so low. Had this been a traditional Hollywood movie, Antonio would be redeemed when, 
perhaps through a happy accident, he gets his bike back. Instead, we see Antonio and Bruno head back home dejected. And we know that Antonio's dignity and heart will be broken even more when he tells his wife the news. It's a credit to Vittorio De Sica's talent as a director that this works so well, given that he was working in uncontrolled conditions and with non-actors. The best of these is undoubtedly Enzo Steola as young Bruno, whose facial expressions alone can make one laugh or cry on a whim. This is a role worthy of an Oscar nomination, although given the actor's age and the fact that the film is an American, probably would have been an impossibility in the 1940s. Rome itself features as heavily in the film as any of the characters, with Antonio and Bruno traveling from one neighborhood to another and meeting different people in each one. We meet the communists, an actor who moonlights as a criminal, an overly friendly man in an expensive suit who looks like a pedophile on the prowl, an old woman who claims to tell the future, a young man who may or may not be the thief, but who is protected by his neighbors, and a homeless man who knows more than he's telling and seems indifferent to Antonio's plight. All these supporting characters represent 1940s post-war Rome probably better than any other film made. Despite their mostly innocuous and uneventful appearance, they are so organic that they draw us into the picture. Bicycle Thieves certainly isn't my personal best movie ever, but it impressed me so much because it does so much with so little. As I mentioned, the plot is minuscule. These aren't professional actors, yet their performances are perfect. This means, for all intents and purposes, this is a perfectly crafted film. De Sica took everything he had and seemingly had me wrapped around his little finger by the end. Even if you could care less about Italian neorealism, I recommend this film. There are, of course, detractors and philistines who will probably proudly profess that they'd prefer to watch paint dry. But if you've been listening to this episode so far and haven't seen the movie, it's about time you did. It's a slice of a time and place preserved so well in cinema that it's akin to traveling back in time. And the Sika certainly did put the real in neorealism for me. That's all I have to say about Bicycle Thieves. Tune in next week when I talk about Nine Queens, the 2000 Argentinian thriller directed by Fabian Belinsky. In the meantime, feel free to email me with any questions or comments at 1001moviespodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter at 1001moviespc. Until next time, happy viewing.